Hey guys, welcome back. So I recently moved and I'm almost done setting up a makerspace in my new one bedroom apartment. And considering how I live in the New York City area where space is extremely limited, I thought you guys might be interested in a little tour to see how I managed to build a product development studio in a space that's essentially the size of a closet. When my girlfriend was looking at new apartments, my only request was that I could have a small area to build a workshop. Now, that sounds simple enough, but if you're familiar with New York City real estate, that's easier said than done. So you can imagine my surprise when she called and said she actually found something. I didn't want to lose it, so I agreed to sign the lease without even seeing it. And when I did finally see it, I was crushed. The space was much smaller than she described. It's basically a tiny alcove in the back of the laundry room, so I knew I had my work cut out for me. Anyway, I'm almost done, so let me give you guys a tour and I'll show you how I use the space. So this is the laundry room, and in the back, there's this little nook that I guess was originally intended to store laundry supplies. I don't know. Maybe it's 10 by 5 foot. It's only about the size of a closet, but it's all I got, so I had to make it work. Luckily, it's part of a laundry room, so I have access to both 110 and 220 power with plenty of outlets. And the 110 outlets are rated to 30 amps, which is incredibly rare in New York City apartments. They're usually only 15 amps. And some of the gear I have in here is pretty powerful, so having access to this type of power was definitely a blessing. All right, so in this corner, this is where my torch is set up. The torch I use is made by Gentech. It's similar to the Smith Little Torch, but I feel this one is made a little bit better. And I'm not sure about now, but when I bought mine, it was also a lot cheaper. It can run off propane or acetylene plus oxygen. If you're just getting into jewelry making, here's a tip. Don't bother buying bottled oxygen. Buying it and storing it, it's just going to be an expensive nightmare. And the small disposable bottles, they don't even last an hour. What you're going to want to do is buy an oxygen concentrator so you can make your own oxygen on demand. The thing is, these machines are expensive. But if you're smart, what you're going to do is check Craigslist or Facebook Marketplace. And if you're lucky, you'll find someone selling a used one. Insurance companies supply these machines to terminally ill patients for home use, and after the patient dies, family members will post these things online and sell them for almost nothing. They really just want to get them out of the house. So if you're lucky, you can find them for like 50 bucks, and then you have oxygen forever. It's a little awkward, but if you can find one, it's definitely worth it, especially considering how expensive oxygen has gotten recently. This one is 5 liters per minute, which works fine for mini torches, but if I had to do it over again, I would look for a 10 liter per minute. Five is just slightly underpowered in my opinion, but definitely workable. I have these cabinets here that hold my faceting machine and some storage under here for all my casting supplies. Next to my torch, I have my pulse arc welder. I did an entire video on this machine like a month ago, so I really don't have much more to say about it, except for the fact that I recently added this 3D printed gas generator. These machines work without shielding gas, but you'll get black soot on your welds that's sometimes hard to remove. So I recently made this an attempt to minimize the soot. And it totally works. The way it works is you fill this bottom container with a mixture of water and baking soda, and you fill the top container with vinegar. As the vinegar slowly drips into the baking soda, it produces carbon dioxide. And you use this knob here to turn it on and off and regulate the pressure. Considering this welder uses such a tiny amount of gas, this is actually a pretty good solution. Just filling it once lasts me a few days of average use. Probably not as good as argon, but it's a lot better than nothing. And after the line is purged, the black soot completely disappears. So I'm happy with it. If you're interested in seeing everything this type of welder can do, I did a full review video about a month ago. You can check it out. Next over here, I have my rolling mill. This one is made by Viver. I mean, Viver isn't a real company. What they do is privately label cheap existing Chinese products and then distribute them globally under the name Viver. About a decade ago, they had a pretty crappy reputation. They would throw their name on almost any piece of junk. But lately, they seem to have cleaned up their act quite a bit. They're doing a much better job vetting the products they attach their name to. So at least the stuff I've gotten the past couple years has been pretty good quality at a really good price. And this rolling mill is one of the good ones. This thing is solid. I abuse the hell out of it, but it's built like a tank. I also have the Viver Slip Roller. I don't use this as much. I keep it stored under here and I mount it in the vise whenever I need to use it. I've been trying to design a mini turbine jet engine that I'll hopefully have some time in the future to start fabricating soon. That's actually why I bought it for rolling the combustion chamber parts. So yeah, hopefully I get some time soon to put it to use. Speaking of the vise, it's part of my Harbor Freight workbench, <laughs> the famous Harbor Freight bench. I don't think they even sell these anymore. They used to sell these for $89. They were pickup only, and you'd have to get there first thing in the morning as soon as the delivery came in because they would be sold out almost immediately. But I got lucky, and I scored one of these before they stopped selling them. 
It's not the most sturdy bench in the world, but for 89 bucks, it's fantastic. I'm not aware of anyone who sells a similar sized workbench for anywhere close to that price, so I'm not surprised they discontinued these. They had to be losing money, especially since the tariff started. Forget it. Everything is so much more expensive now. Next is my cheap workshop laptop. It's called a Yep Book. <laughs> these are pretty much only sold in China. I just use it for running my laser and CNC machine. I have a real work computer, so I just needed something cheap and disposable to run my equipment on because everything in here takes a beating. I got it brand new, still in the box, for a hundred bucks on Facebook Marketplace from a shady Chinese guy who chain smoked and he had a room full of them. I don't have anything sensitive on here. It's not even hooked up to the internet, but before I did anything, I did a clean install anyway. I just didn't trust this thing. But so far, so good. It seems to be doing the job. I mean, for a hundred bucks, I can't complain. Next is my CNC machine. This is my newest addition. This is the Makara Carvera Air. I'm not new to CNC. I've been using CNC machines at work for over a decade. But the machines we use are made by Roland. And Roland CNC machines don't use G-code. They have this proprietary, like, user-friendly cam software called, I think, SRP Player or something like that. It's really easy to learn. So for my personal CNC, I wanted something similar because I don't know G-code. And the fact that Carvera Air also comes with its own cam software was one of the many factors that made me choose this machine over others. As a matter of fact, the machine looks a lot like the Roland MDX-40A that I was using. And I wouldn't be surprised if it wasn't at least a little bit influenced by that design. Except the two machines are like night and day. The Roland machine, for starters, is something like four times the price. And while it can machine soft metals, it's not advertised for that. It's mostly for plastic and wood. And if you do machine aluminum, it's painfully slow and loud. But the Carvera Air, aside from being only a quarter the price, has better specs in every measurable way. It can machine just about every metal I've thrown at it so far, because unlike the Roland, it's actually designed for metalwork. It can even machine steel if you take it easy with your feeds and speeds. Mine came with an optional fourth axis for machining round stock or doing two-sided jobs, and this is the toolkit it comes with. The amount of accessories and tools that are included is jaw-dropping. I mean, check this out. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten different end mills here. And there's also an entire second bag of bits and all sorts of tooling. It comes with these origin point brackets for mounting square stock, a ton of alignment pins, mounting screws, a bunch of different size clamps. The standard collet and tooling is one eighth, but it also comes with an additional quarter inch collet in case you need to use larger tooling, which in my case was really helpful because the plan is to try and use the machine for lapidary work and sintered diamond tooling isn't available, or at least I couldn't find any in eighth inch. I was only able to find quarter inch sintered diamond tools, so this additional collet is really helpful. Now the machine isn't designed for lapidary use, so a strong disclaimer here. This will probably void your warranty, because it's not designed to be used with flood coolant. So my plan is to use this 3D printed shallow dish mounted to the platform and see if I could carve lapidary material using diamond tooling while it's submerged underwater. There's a few details about this particular machine that make me think it might work. The machine is completely enclosed, so that alone will limit potential splashing. The ways on the machine are pretty well covered and protected from water, provided it's just minimal splashing. And I'm thinking I'll try and include some sort of additive to the water to maybe try and thicken it slightly. I'm thinking if the water is a little bit thicker, it might reduce the potential for splashing. But I just need to do some testing first and see what's possible. But that's the plan at least, to hopefully use this for not only metal, but also lapidary use. I want to use this machine to master lapidary CNC and hopefully use that knowledge to help design the lapidary CNC attachment for the gumball station. And moving on, that's the next machine in line. I have the gumball station on this little table at the end. I recently received the parts to build the CNC attachment, so that's coming really soon. I'm not going to spend any time on this machine because, again, I did a full video on this a couple months ago, but I've been getting a lot of use out of it recently. I'm really loving this thing. And because it's in a laundry room, I had a pre-existing drain in the floor, which is really convenient for dealing with the water. All the gumball parts I store under here for when I need them, and the base unit sits on my desk and functions as an everyday bench polisher when I'm not using it for anything else. On the opposite side, I have my Mopa laser. If you're not familiar with fiber lasers, these things are awesome. It can mark on metal, both black and even in color, over a dozen different colors. It can anneal, engrave, it can do deep 2D engraving. My machine has an automatic Z-axis, so mine can even do 3D engraving in metal. And you don't even need STL files. You can do 3D engraving using grayscale height maps, which is really cool. 
And now with recent AI developments, creating files is a breeze. There's a YouTuber I follow called Applied Science, who has even recently figured out how to engrave holograms using his Mopa laser. So these things are really cool. If you have a Mopa laser, check out his channel. He's doing incredible stuff. Luckily, I have a window in this room, so for exhaust, I use this little portable inline fan that's also good for dust and soldering fumes. And the last piece of equipment in this room is my kiln. It's one of the few machines I own that's made in America. Mine is made by Paragon. I think it's called the Sentinel Express, and it can get hot enough to melt copper, but I use it mostly for enameling. I want to eventually get an induction furnace so I can cast steel. I'll need that when I start building my turbine engine. I'll put that here, and then I think I'll be done with this space. I won't be able to fit anything else in here. I can barely fit what I already have. On the other side of this wall, I have my resin printer and a wash and cure station. And I stole a corner of our living room to keep my two FDM printers. This printer is the Hallett X1. And again, I did a review of this machine in a previous video, so I don't really have anything to add other than this is an awesome machine. It's currently running batches of parts for a new EDC I'm working on. And speaking of EDCs, for those who backed the Kickstarter, not sure if you saw the most recent update, but we're getting ready to begin production. Surveys will be going out, I think, on Monday, so keep an eye out. I'll post an update in Kickstarter as soon as they begin going out. So Trump recently announced the new 100% tariff in addition to the already existing 30%. This is going to make shipping a lot more expensive. So in order to offset the loss, I was thinking of selling another EDC that I made myself here in the United States using my Carvera Air. But instead of EDC being an acronym for everyday carry, in this case, it means every dog carry. It's a customized pet tag that transforms into an EDC. My inspiration for this idea came from the cartoons I grew up on. They always portrayed St. Bernard's carrying rescue supplies around their necks. And this idea just stuck with me. I guess to me, it just made sense to combine a tool that you'll always need with your dog who's always there when you need him. It easily pops off your dog's collar and transforms into a knife for opening boxes or packages. It has a mini screwdriver in the end. It can function as a bottle opener. It's also a mini caliper for measuring the thickness or length of objects up to one inch or in one inch increments. I didn't sharpen this prototype enough, but when I do, it'll also work as a mini clippers or scissor. Everyone will be customized with your dog's name engraved on the front, and for a small additional fee, I can add your address, phone number, or whatever other information you might want engraved on the inside. This one won't be a Kickstarter. They'll be custom made and shipped by me within, I don't know, maybe two weeks of ordering. Unfortunately, on this one, I can't do international shipping just yet. So at least for now, it's U.S. shipping only. But if there's enough interest, that might change in the future. I'll put a link in the description for those interested. All right, so I hope you enjoyed the tour of my new makerspace. If you're interested in checking out the Carvera Air, I'll add a link in the description. I saw recently they're also coming out with an even smaller desktop CNC that might even be better for those strictly looking to use their machine for jewelry making. I think it's called the Z1. If you're a jewelry maker, you might want to check that one out too. I also have my own Amazon store where I list everything I use in my videos. I'll also add a link to that in the description. If you buy anything on Amazon after clicking the link, the channel earns a small commission, so it's a nice way to support the channel for free. Alright guys, I think that's going to do it for this video. The diamond tooling I ordered should be here any day. So I'm guessing my next video I'll be showing progress both using the Carvera Air for lapidary CNC, as well as the CNC attachment for the gumball station. As always, if you want to build your own 3D printed everything machine, all the information can be found in the description. Alright guys, thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time.